Um, happened to be fortunate enough to be at the um, in the in the, the launch facility at that time, as I had been for all the uh, the uh, this Apollo launches up to that time. The um, the interest, of course, in the uh, from the press and a lot of outside people who looked at that as a um, a little uh, different than the than maybe the other launches uh, increased the intensity and the emphasis and interest. I think in the, in that particular launch, <clears throat> you have to recognize that. Um, at that time, uh, when we launched that particular one, we knew it was going to the moon. That was a big, uh, the big flight. Uh, but the the previous flights were um, from a launch operation standpoint, which is what the uh, what the business we were in, and the uh, and and speci specifically the Marshall Space Flight Center, the uh, the launch activity from the first of the uh, of the Saturn Vs. Uh, was pretty much the same that day as it was for the. I mean, it was for the for the, the lunar landing. It was for the first one. You uh, you obviously emphasize getting off the pad and uh, and getting yourself into orbit. The upper stages you watch on TV. There's the second and third stage and uh, and to to separation. But um, from a launch operation standpoint, uh, from a launch vehicle standpoint, you didn't. It wasn't any different than uh, than the first one for all practical purposes, other than the fact that the mission was different. We'd gone through a series of um, of, uh, of development flights, if you will, getting to that point. One of the uh, the um, Previous flight, S, uh, SA-8, ST-8, uh, was the eighth of the Apollo's uh, launches. That one actually circumvented the moon. That was, um, that was very, very significant to a lot of people who had never, <clears throat> never seen men get outside of low Earth orbit like this to actually go up and go around the moon. So that was a very significant too. Another significant uh, flight before that was the next one, where it was actually uh, circle the moon and, and uh, transferred from the Apollo uh, capsule into the limb uh, module before it didn't actually go down to the, uh, to the surface. But the buildup of this was, um, uh, was, um, was, didn't, wasn't routine exactly, but the buildup did in fact, from a launch operation standpoint, was like another launch, if you, if you will, recognizing the significance of what was going to happen a few days later when the, uh, when the, when the, uh, the lunar uh, module was to sit down on the moon. And that, was, of course, was, uh, was most important. But I, um, uh, is, uh, from, a, from a different, uh, what we did differently in the, uh, as far as launch preparation, there was not that much difference. Um, the, uh, you had to go through the same sequence. You, uh, you had to look at the same red lines. You had the same, same concerns. Uh, but it um, clearly, uh, after the launch, the uh, the press uh, made it a little different because there were you know, uh, interviews and TVs and everybody was in being asked some similar kind of question. What's your thoughts about today? How do you feel about this? Uh, and and I don't know whether everyone was like me, but I hadn't really thought about thinking that much different about it from a, from a launch standpoint. Well, the um, it seemed to be the norm at that time. The difference uh, between then and today is that uh, we had one one focus, one one real goal, and it was established by President Kennedy, as you know, to get a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth within a decade, and uh, and that was NASA's primary mission. Uh, it was uh, everybody in the in the system understood that. Everybody worked. To uh, to accomplishing that, but in order to meet the time, you had to to have a well laid out plan where things fit together. You had to be able to expect the unexpected, and be able to adjust to it. And we did have some we had some problems in the in in launches. We had some problems with the Gemini, uh, a very significant one that got uh, corrected right away when the, on the one of the first EVAs. Um, the environmental control system wasn't such that it was um, it was properly uh, uh, conditioning. I mean, he, he perspiration got in his eyes, and that's sort of, those kind of things you had to had to expect. But at the same time, you. Um, you didn't have to be uh, be told that you got a problem and you got to correct it. People started working on correcting a problem right away. Whether it was a launch vehicle problem, we had some engine problems in the uh, uh, in the in the early days. We 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 had good instrumentation. We analyzed the problem, and people hit the ground running. The the objective was to be able to solve that problem and get on with it, and that was the norm. So um, the one of the best things I think that happened to in within the Apollo. And there was uh, first off there was a plan that, that got us from one one stage to the other. You learn something on every flight. You uh, you minimize duplication uh, of, uh, of of effort. So you focused on those things that you needed to uh, uh, to accomplish before you went to the to the next uh, next step. And as such, when you um, 
when you recognize you didn't accomplish that, then you had to make adjustments, and the, the planning for that was extremely well done, and the the sense of um, of responsibility of uh, of every individual. Everybody had a had a had a job to do. They didn't have to be told. You didn't have to look for a procedure because you didn't have a procedure in those days. That was in the early part of the days. You didn't have a process or procedure. You did what you had to do to to solve the problem. You uh, you brought that to the attention of the right people from a decision making standpoint. There was no Lack of uh, of empowerment and and and, and causing people to uh, uh, to do their job. Yet the the organization was such that you you knew when to bring a problem to the next highest level and how to get got dealt with. So it seemed to be the norm as a pro. It wasn't anything unusual. It's just that's just the way we work. We had an objective. Everybody had the same objective, and uh, and and as such, we uh, we we focused on that uh, attention that way. Today it would be uh, a little different. We would probably take longer between a um, uh, an anomaly, if we had an in-flight anomaly, it would probably take longer to, uh, with investigating teams and outside reviewers and, uh, and, uh, and, and understand and analyze the problem uh, before we went, went forward with, it, with, with corrective action. So, uh, so you, it would take longer today, but then in those days you, you had the right people, you had those people on the program. It's one of the things about NASA at that time, when NASA first uh, got established in 1958, and then we became uh, part of NASA with Marshall in 1960. That uh, that they brought together a NASA uh, 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 that of uh, some of the best best talent in the world, and uh, we were with the, with the the NACA centers and the and other uh, organizations uh, that took from the Army, the Marshall Space was became, became the Marshall Space Flight Center. We had the we had the, the very best talent in the world. We had the knowledge, all the knowledge that was really needed. To be able to accomplish a, a lunar uh, landing and return was focused within the agency, and that's uh, that. That was that was one benefit. It was recognized that uh, that capability existed not only among ourselves but on the outside. The Congress recognized that. The administration recognized that. Industry recognized that. Uh, they put their best people in it. So the combination of industry and government, you had the best uh, best available talent in the, in the in the world to do that, and that's. Uh, and we focused on the on the objective and accomplished it. Um, in 1965, I, uh, I was in. Um, I moved to Florida, representing the uh, the, the Saturn program manager. I, mean, I worked for Marshall while I was uh, stationed in, in Florida, so I got the benefit of um, of working through uh, uh, all the, the Saturn launches and all the, the pre launches up to that time. On the night of the um, uh, of that uh, the actual sip when uh, Armstrong set foot on the moon, I was I lived in Titusville uh, near the Cape. And I was at home, and I watched it on TV, like a lot of other people. So that was uh, that. That was uh, it was something I think that uh, that nobody in uh, it had anything to do with space or knew anything about what was going on. Maybe around the country, but at least in the um, in Brevard County in Florida, who uh, who uh, who was interested and knew about uh, what was going on. I think everybody was watching that uh, that that historic moment. And the uh, if you're a spectator, and I've never been uh, 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 as a spectator to a launch, so I'm not sure how how that <laughs> that works. I've always either if I've been there, I've always been uh, been in the in the launch facility associated with the launch activity. Um, there's a certain amount of discipline that you have to have in uh, in in performing a countdown. That discipline was the same that day as any other day, up to the time we had uh, we had lifted off and uh, and gone through. You know, when you recognize that your first stage is successful, in the second stage, and you're monitoring this on the telemetry and TV, and the third stage is is successful, that says that the uh, the launch vehicle has done most of its job, at least to get the uh, the uh, the third stage and the uh, and the, the the Apollo capsule and lunar module into orbit. That uh, that's a time for celebration, and uh, and that's uh, the time that the uh, the launch facility or the launch uh, activity is uh, is in pretty well uh, focused and it was at that time into Houston because it becomes a flight operation. So you can relax to the point that uh, that you're still concerned about how the uh, the re the other stages are going to work. But then there's um, <clears throat> there's a lot of jubilation, obviously, and the uh, and then you start recognizing you become more like a spectator as opposed to a, a part of the, the launch operation. There's a discipline in the system where um, 
where you don't, uh, you're not talking about this as being a different launch. You're, you're following procedures. You're, you've got to, uh, you've got a job to do. And it's only after that point, after you've got into orbit, that um, that there's some relaxation and people are able to uh, uh, to, to talk about the, the thing. And then you become more like a, a, an individual who came just to watch the launch. And so it Once you lift off, and when and we've gone through the the preparation, the engines fire, and you clear the tower, <clears throat> you're, there's not a heck of a lot you can do, uh, and so it was on its way. The um, the we were listening to the communications, and uh, and had not I think it was Conrad was a uh, was a, uh, a commander there. Had he not been perceptive uh, enough uh, immediately, and I'm not sure exactly what triggered him to do this, but he recognized that there, that there had been a, a lightning strike, and he reported that. That, um, that then uh, brought a different kind of, a, of a attention to, to the ascent phase. Still not a lot you can do about it. You're going to go ahead and go through the, uh, the second and third stages. What we were, <clears throat> were concerned about is the effect that that, uh, that lightning may have had on, uh, let's say, scrambling memories or resetting uh, computers or, or the avionics, uh, if you will, in the, in the third stage. So what we were able to do on the ground, again with telemetry, was quickly well, uh, go through an assessment to, to verify that nothing had uh, uh, nothing had been disrupted with that. So it was again um, ability to do that was uh, one uh, the early recognition of what happened, and uh, and then because of that, a knowledge of what was uh, of the of the system and the, the the telemetry feedback, which we had plenty of on the, on those missions. Uh, it was easy for the engineers to be able to to make that assessment and come to uh, to a pretty pretty easy conclusion. He was at all the launches, always uh, press conferences. There was always reviews of the uh, of the readiness of the of the launch vehicle. He was um, he was in the blockhouse and uh, in, in at every launch, and and that's where I was. So um, so I had contact with him from a from a from an operation standpoint. Uh, I didn't report directly to him. I reported to the uh, to the program manager, Saturn program manager, who did in fact report directly to him. In um, in 1969, I did uh, when I moved uh, back to to Huntsville. I was the technical assistant to von Braun's deputy, uh, Dr. Eberhard Reese. And as such, I was um, in the uh, in the suite, uh, the ninth floor suite. And uh, and I became mo a lot more exposed to him until he uh, in 1970 when he went to uh, went to Washington, and that um, that consisted of most uh, all reviews, um, uh, of no matter what program uh, we uh, we had lunch together. He and the staff uh, every day. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting individual to be around, whether um, for, from a social standpoint or from a technical standpoint. So he had, I had more more direct contact with him on a daily basis after from between 1969 and 1970 when he left. Um, if you ever met, had an opportunity to meet him, he had a, a lot of charisma, very intelligent person, very um, eager to uh, to expand his own knowledge of whatever. I mean, if it was, had any 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 association with science, he was um, he was totally open to, to discussion. He enjoyed uh, uh, trying on new ideas to uh, to his immediate staff and uh, and getting their uh, their input. There is um, there is a obviously you can see how different people lead, and I would put him in the lead if you want to make a distinction between leader and manager. He was clearly a leader. Uh, he probably didn't always make all the, the right decisions. He wasn't always right, but, but the, his process of bringing to himself to the system to a decision was such that uh, he made the right decision. And he did that by... Um, by making people feel comfortable, whether you were uh, my first meeting with him, I was a very junior engineer, but he was, uh, and but he made you feel comfortable. He had a wide uh, uh, range of, uh, of subjects to talk about. He was very patient. He um, he never seemed to be impatient. I'm sure at times he uh, he he was uh, that I didn't see. He became impatient, uh, but he was uh, he was he seemed to have the time to to listen to. Uh, uh, to ideas and, and your opinion, yeah. but he did um, command uh, uh, with a seemed like a minimum of uh, of effort uh, uh, a following of uh, again a very intelligent people. Back to my, uh, my point about uh, the agency in general, you had uh, some of the best um, 
uh, scientists and engineers in the country, and they uh, uh, he seemed to have a a, a, a way of uh, about uh, bringing out the best in those individuals, <clears throat> and uh, and doing it in a in a very calm and nice way. I don't know. I never I've never been was around him where I felt that he offended anybody. Now that um, <clears throat> that comes with um, with maturity, and that comes with um, with uh, uh, recognition of the uh, of of what space can do for you. At that time, we weren't uh, recognizing the benefits of um, of, uh, of being in space from an Earth observation standpoint, an environmental standpoint. We weren't recognizing the benefits of microgravity research. We weren't recognizing the benefits of uh, of weather satellites. So we weren't recognizing the benefits of communication. Now, so but we did have recognized the objective of getting to the moon. A lot of people, uh, you know, from uh, didn't really question that. Maybe some of the science uh, people did. You're not really going to get that much science out of going to the moon and pick up, you know, gather a few rocks and come back. That wasn't the objective. The objective was to be able to get to the moon and back, and that fit fit very well into the the administration's plans for um, for attacking the Cold War. And there's no question about that. So it was a different objective. The Congress didn't question it because it was a good good. Um, a good objective. The science uh, didn't uh, didn't question because they really didn't have enough uh, of uh, science objectives to uh, to spend as much money, for instance, as we in space as we had spent on the Apollo program. So we were a different set of objectives. Now, what we proved uh, to the world, one we I think it went a long way to winning the, the Cold War. We also proved is the uh, if what we can do in space. That then brought in to to other other disciplines, other other things to be able to do, and that's what we're faced with today. It's not a bad deal. We've now said that. And proven to ourselves that space uh, can benefit a lot of things. Therefore, you diversify. When you diversify, you don't have the single objective as we've had before. We do more, much more today in space than we did in the Apollo days from a science standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from an application standpoint. So it's, uh, that, that goes with the territory. We've proven the, the benefits of space, and it's going to increase even more. So diversification comes with the, with the territory. And, uh, and, and I think that's good for the country. We've opened up a new frontier. It's a new territory. It's, uh, it's, and I don't think we've found all the, the benefits of, of this yet. Um, once we get more into, the more, learn more about the, the planetary system, the, uh, the Hubble telescope, you're going to find more and more things to, that need to be explored. And I think it's going to even diversify more. So it's, um, that just happens, and I think it's a good thing for space. I, uh, I don't see, uh, I think the Apollo uh, satisfied part of that objective. I think it brought us to where we are, proved that we can do things. And, uh, and now we need to, to with the... With the limited budgets we have, uh, uh, we need to be fiscally responsible, and we need to ensure that we are, in fact, uh, getting more as much a return on our investment as we can. In a lot of respect, it would have been um, uh, it would have been a lot easier. <clears throat> We would have been able to do um, a lot of computations a lot faster. We would have been able to do um, a lot more analysis, <clears throat> maybe in some cases uh, less tests. We might even been able to do the you know do the uh, the, the program faster. It might have been able to, to get to the uh, uh, to the moon before 1969. I'm not sure that's the case, though, because there were still there's certain things that you have to do. You have to build hardware. You have to you're gonna, you're gonna have to test it. You're gonna have to uh, have to launch it. Um, I would say that the um, uh, we would have maybe more confidence, and I don't know how to how to judge this uh, whether how much lack of confidence that people had uh, uh, the, in uh, in our ability to be able to to accomplish the mission, but uh, there would have been more confidence, I think, in, the, in today's environment in, in having that uh, that computational capability. The other thing that um, <clears throat> that uh, you learn to do is uh, is to communicate uh, where you um, we don't have fax machines but you you learn to um, to talk uh, um, to have confidence first off and that was another thing about the program everybody pretty well knew everybody in the program who had a who had a, a responsibility or who was um, who had an expertise I mean it's a, it was a big program but it's somehow that that you recognize that you rec there were people were identified on who had the knowledge and uh, and, and which group was uh, was held responsible and, and and they felt responsible they didn't have to be told they felt responsible like 
uh, something von Braun used to talk about is automatic responsibility. That means everybody in the system has a responsibility to, um, if they see something wrong or something needs to be done or corrected, they have a responsibility to bring that uh, to the attention of, uh, of uh, either take care of themselves or, or bring it to the attention of somebody who can. You learn to trust people. There was a lot of trust in them. When you say uh, give a person uh, information over the phone, uh, then uh, and it's critical to to the launch. Then uh, the it was a, a kind of a personal thing. You understood. You accepted that. You didn't have to have it. Um, uh, you know, fifty signatures uh, uh, on every document. Uh, that that process came only later. A lot of it came after the Challenger, by the way. We didn't have to have all, you had to have uh, maybe one or two signatures, but you didn't have to have hundreds of, so everybody in the system didn't have to sign up. You, if the man said it's, uh, it's ready to go, have confidence in this, you, you believed him. And because he believed it, and because he did his job, it was, uh, everybody had the same objective. Nobody had any objective to, uh, to get away with anything or to, to circumvent the system and to be able to do anything unsafe. It's not, that didn't factor in. Everybody had the same objective to get to do, do the best we could. The disadvantages of the Apollo uh, in uh, the Apollo era is that we we did in fact get ourselves as an agency so engrossed in the uh, in the Apollo program that we uh, we failed to to focus uh, in the in the later part of the program or in the, the mid part on uh, on where we were going to go from there on new programs. They, they mentioned the Skylab was little after the fact almost uh, that uh, it was recognized we had uh, this uh, very competent agency focused on, uh, in, uh, on manned systems, the best in the world, with uh, the industrial team. And yet we were going we were going to finish the Apollo one day. And, and we didn't have any programs uh, uh, planned that would, uh, would keep that infrastructure in place, keep that capability in place. And that's how the, the Skylab evolved. It was, um, uh, it was built on uh, utilization, as you know, of Apollo equipment. But that, that was a program, in fact, it turned out to be a, this country's first space station and a very good one. But it, uh, it also kept, uh, kept the, the agency together, kept the technical competence there. Uh, we did have to go through quite a reduction in uh, not only in the agency but in the, in the industry community, which I didn't think was good, but at least we, we kept the program going there. The Apollo Soyuz was another one that was the first cooperation with the uh, with the with the Russians. That wasn't exactly a lot of a, a big uh, uh, deal as far as a drawing board kind of thing. It was more of sending up uh, uh, astronauts with the uh, uh, with the the Apollo hardware to be able to uh, to uh, to mate with the, the Soyuz and, and the Russians. The um, it was um, in that time that we were um, we were focusing. Uh, uh, pretty much on the on the shuttle. <clears throat> it was in 1969 that even uh, 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 President Nixon recognized that there had to be some some type of a policy, some place for the uh, for the the country to go after Apollo, and he set up a space a space task group, and that uh, that space task group was headed by then Vice President Agnew, and uh, there were four points that came out of that. I don't remember all four, but two of them. Uh, were to one, I don't know whether this is the right order, but internationalized space was one, and the other was to uh, to develop a, a reusable system. It was obvious that, um, to, the, to the world that um, a reusable system should be cheaper and should be more operable, and you wouldn't have to throw all that hardware away. And, uh, and two things that came out of that in that time period was, was uh, the shuttle, and that, uh, that's a reusable system, and we were working in earnest on the, uh, on the, on the shuttle. And that, uh, in parallel with this, uh, for years, uh, we had been working on a space station, and the agency had to decide which direction to go, a reusable system or a space station. And it was concluded that if we built a reusable system, then it would be good for ultimately building a space station, which is where we're, we're going today. And so those, those two things were, were, were prevalent on the, on the drawing board from a space transportation and a man system standpoint. Um, we, had, uh, we were working on that time the, um, uh, the, the plans for the Hubble telescope, uh, which is up now. That, was that, that work was done here at the Marshall Space Flight Center. The early concept definition and the detailed definition was done, uh, done here. <coughs> uh, from an international standpoint, to be able to uh, to bring the Europeans into the into the man uh, uh, fold, if you will, and into the reusable era of the of the shuttle, 
uh, we established um, uh, uh, the what later became the Space Lab program. It started out as a, a sortie can. That that work was done here. The early design definition was done here at the Marshall Space Flight Center. In fact, I had the, the benefit of managing that task team uh, in the 1972 time period, and I became the, the, the program manager for the for the space station or space lab in 1973. That was an internationally cooperative program between uh, uh, the uh, uh, ten European countries and, and NASA, which we took the lead in here. Uh, that international cooperative Operation has continued. That was the first of the real international man programs. Today, uh, the space station is uh, much broader with international cooperation. There's always been, since I can remember, uh, an international cooperation between the science community. You don't hear a lot about that because it's in the form of, um, of, uh, of different kind of satellites and science. It's not quite as uh, well publicized as a, as a joint mission between the, the United States and the Russians or, or what have you. But those are the kind of things that were on the drawing board uh, at that time, and most of them came into fruition. You know, the problem is we, uh, we didn't have enough uh, of the detail on the, on the drawing board, I think, soon enough, and I think that hurt us after the Apollo program. It was a status quoing of NASA, if you will, after the Apollo, if you see uh, what happened uh, to that. So it's, uh, the, the, the direction could have been, and I think uh, people like Von Braun and, uh, and a few other uh, people in the space business uh, would have liked to have said, okay, we've finished this objective, we'll put the man on the moon, return him, now let's do it for Mars. I think that would have been, uh, if, uh, if he were interviewed, probably his was interviewed at that time, if you could talk to him today, he would probably say that would be uh, uh, an objective. I think realism, uh, though, that, um, that the country wasn't in a position to, uh, to go forward with that at that time was, uh, was probably also recognized. So I, I, there was never any, I don't think, any really serious consideration to, uh, to do any more than, uh, than focus on, um, on developing of the, of the shuttle after the, uh, after the Apollo.